What, what are you doing? You told me I was speaking this weekend. What? I I'm speaking. I, thanks for getting me the table and chair. You can go over there no, now. Man, I, it's my Sunday. No, you said it's on Monday. It's my Sunday. Oh my gosh, you were in your stage. Monday, you said, hey, Roger, can you cover for me this weekend? I'm really busy with stuff at the work. I mean, with all the building and stuff like that. You don't remember doing that? Then you got sick. You said, yeah, but I said by Friday. You called me, you're like, I can't talk, I can't teach. <laughs> i tell you it. what, I'll tell you what. Let me see your notes. Let me see yours. Hey, whoa, whoa, no, 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 you don't look at mine. <laughs> Uh, we can go with that, too. Uh, let's just do it together. Let's just try it out. I don't, I don't know. Hey, you know, it's the first for everything. Bl- if it goes bad, he'll blame it on me, so don't worry. That's just see how it works around this place here. Be, it goes great. Really Look what I did. If it stinks, <laughs> Roger did it. It was Roger's idea. I think that was my water bottle you just drank. <laughs> we'll see how you're talking in three days. You're right. It was. <laughs> <laughs> I was sick like a dog on Wednesday. I did ask him to teach... <laughs> We did. Well, that's exactly what happened. He asked and me to he teach. He calls me whining like a... Never mind. Ah, what are you whining? <laughs> I was just trying to give him a heads up. Hey, well, we might not... I might not be teaching this week. I might not be able to talk. I was like, I, I, it was really bad. But by Friday, I felt great. And I said, let's do this. Let's just do it together. So like I said, if this fails, it's my fault. Just don't blame him. He's Mr. Perfect. So it's going to be... <laughs> <laughs> so it's either going to be really long... Or really bad. Let's both do our own individual <laughs> messages. You do an hour, I'll do an hour. Let's go. Ready? Be- oh, begin. My. Okay. Well, so we're, we're continuing in this series on the, the study of the book of Nehemiah. I hope you guys have been enjoying it. Nehemiah is just a fantastic book. And especially in the middle of a building project, and Nehemiah has just been just, just really stellar at just, just, you know, warding off all the attacks of the enemy and the craziness that's going on. And today we're going to be looking at the topic, we're just calling it distractions to a great work. And we're looking at a lot of distractions because really we live in a world where there's a lot of distract, distractions. And really what's kind of going on in chapter 6 is you ever have one of those days, one of those projects where you're just working on something and you're like 99% done And there's always, you've heard me say this before, there's always that one thing, right? That one annoying thing that you just can't get done. So example, like last week I was mowing my lawn and I I have a riding mower. So I had like 99% of the grass mowed. And I just used my 30 year old push mower um, that I've had, we got as a wedding gift. It just starts on the first pull. I just use it to trim. (laughs) At least the lawn mower still starts on the first pull. (laughs) That's bad. That thing starts on the first pull every time. So I'm just going along, you know, trimming and I'm almost done. And all of a sudden there goes the front right wheel. (laughs) It just rolled right away. And I'm like, I'm finishing it. I don't care if I'm digging dirt. <laughs> you know, I was, gonna, I was determined. I, and I, I finished, but it was like, you got to be kidding me. I'm almost done. And that wheel just, <laughs> I mean, what do you expect from a uh, 30 year old lawnmower? I, but. I can beat that. I can okay. beat that big time. So uh, I had a big old Jeep Grand Cherokee. Uh, not Grand, I did a Jeep Cherokee. And it kept e- just losing antifreeze all the time. Just all the time. And we finally found out there was a leak in one of the radiator hoses. And I had no money as a youth pastor. They don't pay a squat around here. I mean, you know. <laughs> so I'm like, I got, I'm going to replace this thing myself. My friends go, oh, it's an easy fix. You do a couple screws. It's like 14 bucks for the hose. No big deal. So sure, no problem. Well, the first one was easy to get to. The second one was way down and attached to this little pump thing. Okay. I think the water pump or something like that. And I, this, my Jeep had these skid plates. And so you really couldn't get to it from underneath. And so I couldn't get to the place where you just unscrew this little bracket that holds the hose onto the water pump. And so I thought, I have this hacksaw <laughs> that should cut right through that bracket, no problem. So I get under, I'm reaching down through it and I can barely see what I'm doing. I'm, sh- I'm just doing this hacksaw. It's just one of these little handle ones, single little out ones. Things. And I'm just going at it. And I finally, I finally get that, the bracket falls off, the hose off. I get the new one on, and, and since I'm on from above, I get the new one screwed on, no problem. The thing's leaking more antifreeze now. I take it to my, my uncle, who's a mechanic, and he goes, uh, Roger, um, did somebody have a hacksaw under there? <laughs> Why do you ask? <laughs> somebody cut through the wall of the water pump. <laughs> my $20 fix was now $400 fix, because they had to take all this stuff off, this skid place, all the... So that was my one little strap kept me from pre- completing this easy project. Boom. Big money after that. Yep, chop that. Little wheel rolling off the woods. If you're that dumb, maybe I shouldn't have <laughs> you do this 
part. <laughs> Sorry, now I'm coughing. So, so this is kind of what's going on in Nehemiah chapter 6. So let's just jump right into verse 1. And we're going to pick up a third guy who kind of jumps on the bandwagon. As you know, we've been talking about these, these enemies, Sambalat and Tobiah primarily. And then this third guy, Geshem, jumps in. So, so Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Sambalat, Tobiah, and now we get this, this third wheel, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained Though, here we are, we had not yet set up the doors in the gates. One thing left. So they got this one thing left. The wall's done. And all they got to do now is set the doors in place in the gates. And, and so our, the enemy always knows when you're at that, that ninth or the 11th hour, right? You get, you're almost done, and then, and then craziness happens, right? Yeah, but what I like about this is Nehemiah does something very, this very upfront and wise. He identifies the problem right up front. He identifies these three stooges, these three guys that are kind of going after him, as part of his enemies. He knows who he's dealing with. It's not like he's blindsided, like, oh my gosh, I didn't know you guys didn't like me. It wasn't anything like that. He knew right up front, and he identifies, these are my enemies. And he knows. And so we often in life, we don't tend to do that enough. Not that we won't go, you're bad, you're bad. It's not like that. But sometimes we let people in too close that if we were more wise about who we selected to let close to us or to let into the gates or to listen to, we would be more, um, we would protect ourselves a little bit better in this whole situation. But we let so many people just in. We don't identify the threats soon enough. And so when we, here Nehemiah, he looks at, he goes, I know who I'm dealing with. These guys are my enemies. Let's not, let's not sugarcoat this. I mean, I'm sure that there was no political correctness about this. It was, these are my enemies. And I think that is just really cool that he identifies that right up front and says, these are the people and everything else I'm gonna make, every decision I make after this is gonna be based on the fact that these people are my enemies. They're not for me, they're against me. And if they're against me, they're against my God. Or I should maybe have said, if, I, if I'm against, if they're for me, they're for my, they're not, if they're not, oh my gosh, fix me, finish me. I can't think now, talk me. You know what I'm trying to say, right? You're finished. I'm finished, thanks. <laughs> Your turn. So, so, you what's, say so what's going on here is that this is their last ditch effort to thwart the project. You know, I mean, the wall's done. Now it's like, man, if we're going to stop this, we, we got to do it now. And so this is their, their last ditch effort. So these guys are, they're, they're ready and he knows it. So verse two comes along and says, so Sambalat and Geshem, what do they do? They send a message. You ever have somebody send you a message you didn't want to read, right? So he sends them a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. So, so here, <laughs> what? Oh no. <laughs> I've met a few girls called, oh no. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Isn't it hilarious that they do that? <laughs> I think God was laughing when he wrote this. He goes, 2,000 years from now, this is going to be a great joke. They wanted to meet in the town of, oh, oh no. no. <laughs> oh no. So rule of thumb is, never meet with your enemy or anybody in a place called, oh no. All right? And, never. And, and really, I mean, it is kind of funny when you, when you think about it. But I, I think there's, there's just some really good meat here in that, Nehemiah understands, and, and so they're, they're sending him this, this message, asking him to, to meet in this place, and really what's going on here is they're trying to get him outside of the walls of protection, you know? And so really, I would say one of the first distractions, these are, we got a lot of distractions today, but this is kind of a sly distraction that's going on here. And the first distraction that the enemy's trying to do to keep them from completing, number one, is just isolation. Mm. And, and this is a subtle one, I think, that just kind of sneaks in, in on us, that he wants to isolate us. He wants to get us out from the protection of the body of Christ, the way God designed it. We talked about this throughout the series. You know, they're working together side by side on mission, you know, and there's momentum going. And then all of a sudden, remember, it went internal, and now they're, they're biting and devouring one another, taking advantage of one another, all this craziness. Nehemiah, he's, I mean, I'm telling you, we've been working on this building. It's been, it's just a lot of work. And, and there's just a lot of things mentally trying to keep it all together. And I, I don't know how Nehemiah never loses his cool. You know, I don't know how he just keeps, I mean, it's just because he just presses into God. He knows, he knows the essence of this mission. And, and it's all for the glory of God that his name would be proclaimed throughout the end of the earth. And so this last ditch effort, they're trying to get him isolated. And, and so 
basically what goes on here is like they're trying to get them to go to a place like, hey, let's, it's kind of the guise of, you know, let's meet for coffee. <laughs> let, let, let's meet, you know, and, and just kind of reconcile. And, and really the whole time he knows that it's, it's this ploy. And so when it comes to isolation, I think just kind of good rule of thumbs. One, you know, never meet in a place that you know is a no-no, right? Right? So, so that's kind of what the village of Ono is. It may look really good, and it's really kind of a respite kind of place, like, hey, Nehemiah, just come and take a break. You're working really hard. Get away. Come meet with us. We can get some coffee. But just always kind of put those boundaries in place that if it's, an, if it's a no-no, don't compromise yourself. You know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and, and so never allow someone to try to, you know, get you isolated and just be careful not to isolate yourself. So one of the things I just kind of thinking about was I remember years ago, I listened to this, this marriage talk and this guy was talking about how men and women are, are wired differently and how men have their nothing boxes, you know? And, and so guys, you know, we just like to veg in our nothing boxes, right? And, and we can spend hours, <laughs> hours basically doing nothing. It's something to us, but for our wives, it's like... I do that once a week on Sunday mornings. <laughs> Oh, wait, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that out loud. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But, but it's true. We have these nothing boxes, you know? So it's like some guys like to go sit in a tree stand for weeks, maybe, <laughs> you, you know? And, and it, or, you know, or like to, I like to go out fishing, you know? And we just, like, we just have to disengage and veg. And I just remember, you know, talking with somebody that says, you know what? It's like, you, you, men, we have to have our nothing boxes, All right? We do. But you can't stay in your nothing box too long. Because if all of you do, if you do is isolate and do nothing, then all you get is nothing, right? So we have to have our nothing boxes to get kind of refreshed, but we don't want to stay in that nothing box too long, or it, it, can, be, it can not be good. And so I just want to, let me just put this point up here. Isolation for the wrong reason brings harm. Let me say I used to see this in youth ministry for years and years and years. Did youth ministry 23 years. I'd have young couples... Young, I see just young people, they'd all be coming, we'd all be having great Bible studies together, we'd be worshiping together, and then the twinkle of eyes would meet across the room, and a little couple would be formed. And it was usually within like three or four weeks, they would stop showing up. Or as soon as youth group would be over, they would leave immediately. When everybody used to hang out for an hour afterwards and talk and hang out. Then they would kind of go and they would be there, but they would just be with each other at youth group, and everybody, everybody else felt kind of weird being around them. And then eventually they just stopped coming. Now, being somebody who'd been in youth ministry for years, I knew what was happening. As the relationship was progressing, they were isolating themselves from the very people that were holding them accountable. Either, I don't know the cause or the effect of it, but either the cause was now they're maybe getting into some things relationally, physically, that they shouldn't be doing. Now they feel guilt and shame, and that's why they're not coming. Or the fact that they're not with accountability, that that's opening the doors, isolating them off, to be more vulnerable to those kind of things. And I remember seeing kids who'd meet, strong Christian kids, and they would meet, and within a matter of a month or two, gone, vanish. And I think this is just more than just high school sweethearts, okay? This is adults, this is a couples. You get married, you drop out of the young adult group, adult group you're in, and you never really reconnect anywhere else. You were involved in this one group of these people, and you would just spend so much time because you just isolated your relationship, your marriage so much that you really have no outside relationships beyond your, your doors of your house. Both those are unhealthy. They both lead you into a position like being out in the plains where you're open and you're vulnerable for any attacker. And so that's why we talk about small groups around here so much. To at least be connected somewhere. Now every week you might be staying in your box as a guy, you might stay in your isolation box, but eventually there's gonna come a time or something that's gonna take place that's gonna, you're gonna need those people around you but at least there's some bridge of a connection or relationship that's with other people that it's not like, oh my gosh, my life's going horrible, who do I turn to? At least you're already in the room with the people. You're not isolated off nowhere. Yeah, in the, in the body of Christ, when you read the New Testament, God designed it as our protection. We need one another. We're meant for one another. God didn't build, create us as people. He created us for relationship. Life's all about relationship. You heard me say this. God created us relational beings. We need one another. Um, it's commanded in the scriptures that we need one another. And, you know, through the years that I've been in ministry, which has been a long time, it seems like, um, it is one of those tactics. So as we've been studying Nehemiah, one of the first ways that their enemies attacked them was, we've learned it's always at the beginning of a work. 
You know, the, the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, all right, God creates his good thing. Everything he created was good. The enemy comes right at the beginning. He tries to thwart it at the beginning. Well, if he can't get it you at the beginning, he'll get you right at one of those critical stages. You're one step from making just huge progress in your life. It's like, man, we're going we're gonna to turn our marriage around. Or we're going we're gonna to turn, I'm going to really just do my job differently now in the workplace. And you're at that one critical point. I want to go deeper in my faith. And then right then, the enemy wants to just start messing with you and try to throw out one last ditch effort to get you out of biblical fellowship, out of biblical community, or to isolate you, and then it just becomes a downward spiral. Your faith begins to deteriorate, relationships begin to deteriorate, and and then I've just seen this happen over and over. Now, there is a good thing for isolation, getting away, if you're going to fast, pray, spend time connecting with God, but in this particular case, we're going to see their intention is to harm him, get him isolated outside from the people, from the walls of protection, to harm him. It goes on, uh, the, last, the second part of verse 2 and verse 3, it says, but I realized, and Nehemiah is wise to their plans, I realized they were plotting to what? To harm, harm me. me. Isolation isn't going to be a good thing, you know, because they're, plan- they're plotting to harm me. So I re- replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and me with you. And, and I think it's just a good reminder that God has called us to a great work. He's called us to the greatest work on the planet and the mission of proclaiming the good news of Christ to, to the ends of the earth. And I think we live in a day and a time where we're just, we're just distracted. There's lots of noise, lots of distractions, lots of things that just vie for our time, and we just kind of have to sort through this. So I just kind of, as I was going through this, since Roger didn't have anything good, I was going through this and <laughs> And, and I, and I kind of I put a bullet point together. I just want to put this up here. Is it, I think it's just a good thing to think through, that you are either engaged in a great work for God or a great many things have you engaged in things that don't really matter. Right? And because at the end of our life, we're going to stand before God and give an account for what we've done. And, and sometimes there's, there's so many things that just vie for our time. And we can spend most of our lives, I always use this phrase, you know, I, I feel like I'm chasing wind. You know, kind of like what, what um, uh, Solomon says in the Old Testament. I'll say, Jim, you stealing that from me? That's not yours. That's Ecclesiastes. I know that one. <laughs> but, take take but credit you, for God's work. I huh? see. But you do. You feel, like, you feel like you're chasing wind. I mean, mm. it's, like, it's like even in the building project, you know, it's like I'm calling these companies, you know, and I'm waiting for phone calls to return. And you just, you just kind of wait and you spend so much time and energy and then you forget about something because you called them two weeks ago and they never returned your call. You know, and you feel like, oh, you know, you're spending so much time chasing wind. So then it's like, okay, I just got to focus on the things that really matter. Because there's so many things that can pull us away from the mission and the great work. Um, what, are some, what, do you think some, what do you think are some good ways you can narrow that down? Because I think that's, a lot of us, we have a lot of great things that we could do. And not all of them are bad. What do you think are some ideas, maybe just... Toss out some ideas. What do you think to help narrow down how you know whether something is on task, like a great work, or it's maybe not so great? Because a lot of times we say, oh, I I know I shouldn't be going to the bars and hanging out. That's an easy one. Oh, probably shouldn't be doing that. But sometimes it's, I want my kids to be involved in a bunch of sports. Yeah, well, I... I I want my kids to be involved. I want them to be leaders. I mean, they're going to learn leadership in in that that team sport or... Uh, I got to do this extra thing to help this other person out. And they're all good things. How do we narrow down? Well, I think the key is, and I've done this, you've probably seen this illustration before, is just kind of the big rocks. Yeah. You know, you got to get the big rocks in your life first. You know, it's like one thing that's just been really helpful for me in, in studying Nehemiah is he, he prayed a lot. And, and he spent a lot of time connecting with God. He, he was remembering the scriptures, the promises, and so, I mean, that's just one thing that even in the midst of just kind of the craziness of a busy time with this project, I'm, I'm just making effort every day to stay connected with God, just to sort through, you know, what, where I'm chasing wind and where I'm not chasing wind. Can I throw so, out a couple ideas? I, sure. just, just coming, I'm just sitting there thinking about it right now. Um, am I proud of it the next day? I think that's one, a big one. Uh, am I... If I was to share what I did last, accomplished last week, who would care? Would it be my people, my friends who are godly, who are on pace with what God wants to be done, or would it be my buddies who think that's cool that I went and partied or did something stupid? I did say, oh, it's funny you did that. Who would, be in, who would be impressed most or be more encouraged by what you accomplished? 
So I'm trying to think of how you narrow that down to that field of things that really are important. Because I do, I think we spend a lot of time just chasing after meaning, saying, and some of them are good, but they're not your great work that God has put you in place to accomplish. They're someone else's great work. Uh, I think it'd be in ministry, just for so many years, we all get hit with this all the time. Uh, you guys have wonderful, awesome ideas, and God has laid passions in your hearts that are incredible, but he gave them to you. And what happens a lot of time in ministry, you might come to one of us, because we do ministry at full time, and we want us to accomplish it. It's not mine. God gave that to you. Your great work is your great work. We'll support you, we'll assist you, but it's not, it's maybe not ours because we have a great work as a church. Uh, in a room of this size, there's 40 great, awesome ideas to do things, but sometimes we got to pick what's the most important one for the church overall. Uh, and it, at least I hurt feelings a lot of times. I mean, I know in ministry over years, people got hurt. Well, you didn't like my, this idea, was, or you didn't support me, or you didn't do enough to help me. It's like, it was a great cause, but it wasn't the great work God put in front of me. Yeah, and I think even in the midst of, just anything that comes to mind, in the midst of a building project, you know, the expectation is that everybody's going to show up and help. Because, I, you, I mean, honestly, sometimes it's easy to feel guilty that I, need, I should have been there, I need to be there. You know, I mean, Roger hasn't done anything. I haven't done squat. I haven't done nothing. <laughs> I've missed two weekends in a row. I was out riding a bike. <laughs> but, but in all honesty, I, I think it's good to know what, what your priorities are. You know, and just to stay focused on what God has called you to. Um, because th th God has designed the body of Christ. That there's those that have the time to do certain things. There's others that don't. And, and if you spend all your time feeling like you got to chase wind because you're worried about what somebody else is going to think, you're, you're not going to be effective in, in the main things that you need to stay focused on in your life. And so, so a after hearing my hacksaw story, do you really want me near the building? <laughs> yeah. After my hacksaw? Yes, you get a hacksaw. Bigger chop. You don't want me near the building. So, so I think it is important, you know, that when it comes to this whole thing about isolation, knowing that we're doing it for the right reasons and not let the enemy get, on, get at us. So let me go on to verse 4. So, so the, the enemy's just relentless. We've seen this over and over again. He's just constantly trying to distract us, trying to throw us off course. So it says, four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave the same reply. The fifth time... Sembal's servant came with an open letter in his hand. Now, let me just kind of give you an explanation here. Typically, when you got a letter, you know, it, especially because these guys, you know, Sambal, Tobiah, these, they're regional governors. They're, they're not part of the Jews, the Hebrews. They're, they're regional governors of the, the Arab nations. And usually when they would bring a letter, it would have the signet seal from the king. All right, this is an open letter. So, so it's kind of this, this guy is just like, hey, every, every, the, you know, a lot of people know about this. You know, this, this, is, this is public, public notice of all these things. And so kind of what's going on here is this trap I think a lot of us fall into, you know, where you're trying to convince somebody of something and say, look, a lot of people agree with me. Ever use that line? There's a lot of people that think this. I know that you, what you're doing here is like, but there's a lot of people that think this or say this. Name one. Well, well, Roger. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like, it's like it's an easy thing. And what's going on here is he brings this open letter because he's trying to, he's trying to do this last-ditch effort to convince Nehemiah. Here's a lot of people that have this thought. And you have to stop and say, well, who are these who are the people? Who are the ones? You know? And, and so, so it goes on in verse 6. And here's, here's how to ploy the enemy, this distraction. And we'll get to the point here. So verse 6 says, and this is what it said. There's a rumor. <laughs> There's a rumor going on about you. All right, among the surrounding nations. And Geshem tells me it is true. So he throws in another name. He drops a name, all right? Um, Geshem tells me it's true that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that is why you are building the wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there is a king in Judah. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king. So I suggest that you come and talk it over with me because many people agree with me. A lot of people know about this. A lot of people disagree with what you're doing, right? It was funny because I was, I was talking with somebody last night at my house, um, and my daughter comes walking in, and she goes, yeah, there's a lot of churches. It's like, name one. We're <laughs> <laughs> just kind of being, being, yeah. being funny. But the enemy tries to distract us with a bunch of rumors, a bunch of big fat lies, and, and just false accusations. 
And, and it's easy to kind of let that get in and under our skin. And this is what he's trying to do. Nehemiah's like, look, I'm not coming. And then it's like, look, I got this open letter. This is public notice. A lot of people think that you're, you're up to this. So number two, the second distraction I want to say is this. Not only try to get us to be isolated, but then he tries to get you to focus on what other people think about you. Right? Now all of a sudden it's like, oh, a lot of people think this. Really? A lot of people are saying this. They think you're, you're doing something wrong, that you're, you're up to doing something that's, that's against the rules. And the, and the king, he's going to catch wind of your, your little ply, your little plot, and it's going to backfire. And, and, and I think what goes on in, in this situation, what's happening in our lives, is that, you know, God created us to be loved. Right? I mean, God created us to be loved. He created us as an object of his love. And we all have this, this deep craving inside of us that just craves love. But our brokenness taints that. And, and we all want to be loved. We all want to be affirmed. We all want to be encouraged. And I wish we were better at it. Right? But we know sometimes in our brokenness, we're, we're not. And so, so the enemy just wants to come in because he knows that we want to be loved. And all of a sudden, when somebody says something about us, or there's rumors going on about us, or somebody thinks this, or there's a lot of people that think this, it just plays on our insecurities. And, and isn't it funny, how many times have you had a conversation with yourself about what you're going to say to that other person? Have you ever do that? You get the whole thing thought through, and you're going to show up on a scene, and it's like, okay, they have to probably think this, so I'm going to say this. And then you get there, and it's like, What? They're not even thinking that because the enemy knows where that, that insecurity is and that weakness because we crave love and he just wants to come in and just throw rumors and all kinds of things out to get us to worry about what other people think about us. Do you have any thoughts on that? You did awesome. <laughs> verse 8, verse 8. So Nehemiah replies. He says, I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. You are making up the whole Thing. And, and this is why I just want to go back. We've talked about this throughout the series. That's why it's so important to stay connected with God. You got to know what's true. Yeah. And you got to know what God's speaking to you and focus on truth. He's like, look, there's no truth in anything you're saying. Verse 9, they were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So what did he do? He says, so I continued the work with even greater determination. And if there's one thing that kind of gets awesome. you ramped up, ready to go to do the work and the mission of the kingdom, you know the enemy's just trying to raise his ugly head. He's just trying to stir up things, throw around rumors, whatever. It's like, you know what, God, I'm just pressing in and pressing on and staying focused it, on It's mission. almost a signal that you're doing the right thing. You know what I mean? Because Satan doesn't bother with people who are doing the wrong thing. He just lets them keep doing the wrong thing. But you know when you're making a difference and making an impact, Satan's like, oh, I've got to knock this down. I got to keep this from happening. This guy's going to make some movement. There's going to be some change happening here. We can't have that happening. And so that almost is when you start getting that pushback, it almost says, <laughs> must be doing something right. But we, what do we, so we have to prevent that and, and fight that, that fear that wants to creep in and just say, nope. The truth is, and I just think that's, that's the coolest phrase, that whole part that I think, you're making the whole thing up. The truth is, you know, just that, that mentality. Once again, he clarifies it and doesn't fall victim to it. Yeah, and so I, th I see what's going on here is that there's this, there's this one last-ditch effort where the enemy's just trying to, he's hoping that Nehemiah's got some weakness, some insecurity, some little, you know, crack, you know, in the crevice there in his heart that he can get at. He can't get him to stop getting the people organized, so he's going to try to isolate him, and it's like, that's not working, so now I'm going to throw a letter out here, this open letter. A lot of people think this about you, and it tries to play on our insecurities. Maybe that'll get him to isolate. You better come and meet with me. Because now you're worried about what other people are thinking about you, and it's just this last-ditch effort to pull him off course. And then we kind of hit this last one already. Um, the, we just, verse 10? Okay. Yeah. Nehemiah goes, he goes, later I went to visit. Oh, you left me with all the hard names. I see why you did that. <laughs> I get it. Uh, later I went to visit with Shemaiah, son of Deliah, oh, wait, close, and grandson of, oh my goodness, Methetabel, Metamusel, Meta Meta or what is that? I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, who was confined to his home? I would be too if I was on Metamucil. <laughs> Sorry. Let that one sink in for a second too. Yes, yeah, that's bad. Let me try this in a more serious phase here. This is why he like, he wrote me a letter last because I'm scared. That was his last text to me last night before we were to do this. He said, I'm excited. I said, I'm scared. <laughs> exactly. 
Now you know where my mind works. Later I went to visit with Shemaiah, son of Deliah, and grandson of that word, who's, who was confined to his home. He said, let us meet together inside the temple of God and bolt the door shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. Urgency, urgency, urgency. Why was this important? Why, why is he trying to draw him off into there, Jim? What do you yeah, think? So we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. I, uh, just kind of a third thing I just want to throw in here is just kind of noble causes can be another mm, distraction. Yeah. You know, there, there's, there's just been this animosity for a long time between, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, the, the enemies, you know, when, when God sent Joshua after Moses, you know, saw the promised land but couldn't go in, um, and Joshua went in and conquered that land. There was just great wickedness going on in the land. So God sent his people in there. And so there's just been, and there still is today, you know, there's just been this, this, this deep hatred um, between the Jews and the surrounding Arab nations. And so there's just, there's just they, they want to stop what God is doing. And they want to stop this work. They don't want Nehemiah to complete the work. So there's, there's this animosity going on. So a third kind of ploy throws in there is just this whole idea of noble causes. So... We were kind of, I just kind of jumped the gun on this a little bit earlier, just this idea that there are so many different things that we could be doing, that we want to be doing, that we get spread so thin that we really accomplish very little. And it's just something we try to always be guard on. Any kind of, you're in any kind of leadership, your job is to narrow the vision of the, of the organization of what your process or what you're trying to pull off and try to do. Uh, if you're a coach, you're trying to get everybody on the same page so that we're all focused on what we're trying to accomplish here. And we have so many times they're trying to distract him. They're trying to draw him into a, the, the temple. I mean, it should be a good thing. Oh, let's go in the temple. Um, but it was really kind of, and he had permission to be in the temple. He could be, he had the authority, he had the right to be in there. He could go lock the doors and, and hide in fear and lock the doors and have this little secret meeting. But what was that distracting him from? The great work. He just got insane. I became even more determined. Now you're trying to distract me again. Now you're trying to make it sound all spiritual even. You're going to draw me into the temple. Oh, it must be good then. No, it was just another using almost religion and using uh, all these other things to try to distract him. Oh, this is a good thing. Oh, yeah, come meet in the temple. But in reality, it was just another distraction. You got to call it out. And it, often some of us, and I, I get into this, um, some of us are over-involved. We got ourselves spread so thin trying to do the right thing, trying to be involved in every church thing, trying to do it, and it, you're being effective at nothing. And I think this is a battle that I know seeing volunteers, and this is, I'm just gonna challenge everybody else in the room though. There's like like four or 5% of people that are doing most of the stuff in a church. It's just the reality. I mean, that's where things start happening. You see one person, they're volunteering in four different roles. And we gotta decide, you know, is that the most effective way to use them? And so sometimes we have to tell people no. And sometimes we have to say no to people asking us to do things. And that's what Nehemiah does. He basically says, no. He uh, goes on and he says this. He goes, but I replied, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? It's misusing what the temple's for. He goes, no, I won't do it. Man, if we could all get that in our phrase. If we could just integrate that in, let's just all say it together. No, I won't do it. Okay, so you're really good. No, I won't do, do it. it. Turn to your wife. No, don't say that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> That'll get you in trouble. No, but, no, good. good. No. Well, there's, there's a, and there's another kind of twist to this too. So you remember when, when, when you read in Matthew, um, I think it's Matthew chapter four, where Satan kind of you know tempts Jesus. He's out fasting and praying in the wilderness, and one of the the last ditch efforts was like, hey Jesus, let's meet at the pinnacle of the temple, kind of thing. Remember that? Took him up to the pinnacle temple. He says, look. And then what does he do when he's got him right there in this the house of God? What does he throw at him? He says, look, God's word says. That if you jump off here, you know, that he, he'll protect you. He'll send his angels, mm -hmm. you know, to, to guard you and protect you. And so what's kind of going on here in the midst of this noble cause is that what he's really trying to do is that the enemy is trying to, to get Nehemiah to disobey God. Mm -hmm. Okay, because he could be at the temple, but you're only allowed to be at the temple under certain circumstances. And this was not the circumstance. And so he's trying to get him to sin and disobey God, because if he can throw off the blessing of God on Nehemiah's life by either taking him out or isolating him, he can throw him off and get him to do something he shouldn't be doing and say yes to the wrong thing, because it looks like it might be a good thing, right? Let's go into the temple. The enemy's going to come. Go protect yourself. If he can throw him off and kind of get God's word twisted in his brain, then he can take him out. But Nehemiah continually stood his ground. 
And he said, no. And sometimes we, there, there's good things, even, even church things and spiritual things, that there are noble things that we could be doing. And there's just sometimes we just have to come and just, like, like Roger said, and just say no. No, I, 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 got, I know what God has called me to, and I've got to stay focused on, on that. Even if it may be good, even if it's at church, right? Because I've got to stay true to what God is, has, has called me to. Not that you have to stay comfortable. I think that might be, some people can misuse that and say, well, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to do anything that's outside my little, my little you know, sheltered spot. So God, we're not saying that. This is about purpose. If it gets you off your purpose, and your purpose might be breaking out of that comfort zone you're in. And then some of you guys, uh, me included, at times we, we just get comfortable and we don't really want to disrupt that. But we know what we're supposed to be doing, but we don't. And so there, this isn't saying just to stay back in shelter but, and do nothing, but it's just saying pick the things that matter most to God, not that matter most to your friends, not that matter most to everybody else and the, the neighbors and stuff like that. Um, when we read on, I'll read on for us. Sure. I realized that God had not spoken to him, but that he had uttered this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanibalt, Sanibalit had hired him. Basically, they were hired guns. They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin. Then they would be able to accuse and discredit me. Man, I've been through that before. It's, anybody else been through that? Somebody's discredited you, killed your integrity, questioned your integrity. Man, that is a battle. It is, it's, it's painful. Remember, O oh God, all the evil things that Tobiah and Sanibalit have done. And remember, my goodness, you gave me all the tough ones. Noadiah, the prophet, and all the prophets like her who have tried to intimidate me. So on October 2nd, the wall was finished. Are we going to have the building done by then? <laughs> It'd be nice. Huh. Just, Close. just 50, he did it in 52 if, if days. Would, What's up with, help a little what's bit, wrong with us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll bring my hacksaw. Uh, just 52 days after we had begun, when our enemies and surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. Who got the credit? What was a, who was a parent? God. Yeah, so I, I just think that what's, what's good to see in that is when we know that we're doing what God has called us to, kind of the evidence is in the making hmm. that, that you know that you know because, you know, we saw throughout, we've seen throughout this, you know, even the early couple, couple, first couple chapters in Nehemiah, he said, the, the gracious hand of my God was on me. And, and you will see that in your life. When you're walking according to the things of God, you know, you will see the fruit of the Spirit growing in your life. You're not isolating yourself, but you're staying connected in biblical community. You're staying connected with God. You're growing. You're staying focused, living out the purpose of what God has called you to. Um, just sorting through all that, that, you will see God's blessing. And, and people are going around, it's like, man, God is at work in, in their life. And they know it because they see the evidence in, in your life. You read now. Verse 17. So during those 52 days, many letters went back and forth between Tobiah and the nobles of Judah. So there's, this is, once again, this last dish effort, just constantly throwing these letters. Verse 18. For many in Judah had sworn allegiance to him, because there's this connection, there's this relational connection. So they're swearing allegiance to him because his father-in-law was this guy here, son of Ara, and, and his son, that guy, was married to the daughter of that guy, son of that guy. So verse 19, see, that's all you got to do. It's really simple. You don't have to say, well, that's, oh, You went to off. school for this. I didn't. <laughs> verse 19, they kept telling me about, this is why I love this. So they're sending all these letters, all right? There's this connection there they're trying to play off of. Verse 19, they kept telling me about Tobiah's good deeds. Oh. And then they told him everything I said, and Tobiah kept sending threatening letters to intimidate me. Just this relentless whole thing that's going on here. So what's, what's going on in this last ditch effort? Anybody who's a younger brother or somebody else, they're comparing them. They're comparing him to this other person. Look what they're doing. They're the, this is what they're doing. Anybody been done, had go, lived through that their whole lives? Oh, look what your older brother's doing. Look what your older sister is doing. You're like, I'm the answer. Five boys. I was in trouble. <laughs> you know, it was all that. And, and comparing is one of the toughest ones um, because we start thinking, we start comparing who we are in Christ by how we compare to somebody else. Um, Jim put in this phrase here. This is good. It says, stay focused on who you are in Christ and the work God has called you to. Now, I got an illustration for this one. Okay, so yesterday, I did this bike ride. It's supposed to be 35 miles on a, on a, not on a motorcycle, but on a pedaling bike. And I'm, we do this, and everybody's there, 
and 35 miles, my wife and I and some neighbors, we're gonna go do this thing, and we're all pumped up, and we start riding, we make it to the first stop, 10 miles, no problem, I can do 10 miles, and there was just some really crazy people there, okay, so, you know, most people are wearing, <laughs> like spandex, who shouldn't be wearing spandex, and really tight shirts that really were way too tight and stuff. And so you just see all these different body styles, all these different people, people on bikes that cost like four or $5,000. I mean, some amazing ones. But there was this one cool dude, man, this one cool dude. He was wearing uh, jeans, a tie-dye shirt, a big old beard, and he was riding the most classic um, banana seat cruiser bike with monkey bars like this. And I want to tell you, it wasn't made to look vintage. It was vintage. It was colored rust. That was the color of this bike. And he was there. We're at the 10 miles mark. He's chain smoking. <laughs> I'm like, holy so And in my mind, I'm thinking, this guy doesn't know what he's in for. I've done this thing before. You're going to be dying. So now, that's like mile, that's mile 10. I go, I won't see that guy again. I keep biking on. Now I'm at mile like 30, and I am just dying. I am dying. I'm grasping for breath, just like, like when is this thing in? I'm little GPS says 30 miles. You've completed 30 miles. I'm like, okay, just got five left. No big deal. I can do five. And up alongside me is this, la this lady. I mean, she had to be bo born in the Jurassic period, okay? <laughs> she was old. She comes up on that. I'm, not, I, I'm saying this because I, you got to remember my mindset at this moment, okay? Because I'm like dying. You know, you get kind of those angry thoughts in your head. She pulls up. She goes, did you see the persimmons? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I see, uh, I saw my life flash before my eyes on mile 24. I saw my spirit leave my body and return mile 29. <laughs> I go, no, I didn't see them. <laughs> and she goes, they were the brown things back there that we just rode over. I go, I thought those were my lungs. <laughs> and this lady, she's just, do, 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 do. And she's just cruising along. I'm like, and, and I'm just like, I cannot believe this. Now, at this moment, when you get into this comparison game, I got a decision to make. I can either be inspired by her, challenged by her, or feel defeat as all get out. This lady is here who's much older than I am. She wasn't really born in Jurassic period. I'm just being mean, exaggerating, but much, much older than me. I mean, she was at least 75. She is riding this bike like it is no big deal. Now, I know some of you are like, that's not a big, that's young. 85 is what I meant. Any takers? Any takers? Can anybody top 85? She okay. was 40. She, I, ah! <laughs> she was 110. That's what she was. Let's just say she should not have been at the same pace as I was, and she was. And so I have to make a decision. I think this is how we get to anything when it's comparing. We gotta, when we look at other people in life, um, it's something, and this is the thing, a lot of times we're talking about being trying to get drawn outside the walls, and other people are attacking us. This comparing thing is self-inflicted. It's from within a lot of times. Yes, we get compared to somebody from our parents or whatever. We're, we've all dealt with that. But the worst part is the self-inflicted part. And so when I'm up against this lady and I see her not even breathing heavy at mile 30, I can just feel like, I am such a loser. What am I doing? I'm never going to be like this person. And you name that person. You name your lady. You name, you name your persimmon lady. Who is in your life that you compare yourself to and you have to make a decision? Are you going to be inspired by them, challenged by them? Those two might go together. Or you're going to be defeated by them and have senses of worthlessness. Because what Satan tries doing, he wants to take us and feel defeated, like you're worthless. You'll never be as good as them. You're never going to be like them. I can't keep up with this lady. She's been training for a thousand years, you know? <laughs> I'm never going to be as good as her. And so it inspired me. I'm like, if this lady can do this at her young age, yeah, right, her age, I should be able to finish this. And so I'm feeling inspired. I'm challenged by this. And that's how comparing, it, it, it's bad if we take it and we become self-defeated and we let Satan beat us down and make us feel unworthy and worthless and we can never change. I'm never going to get over this. I'm never going to break this addiction. I'm never going to get over these thoughts that I have. I'm never going to get over this emotion. That's defeat. That's where Satan wanted me, Nehemiah, to walk away. But the heart of Nehemiah was, I grew even greater, determined greater, 
I knew my goal. I knew the great work that God had for me. And I am even more determined now. I see this lady. I'm like, if she can do it, I can do it. And at the end of this race, you get a root beer float. That is it. You get a root beer, you get a big cup of root beer float. And I'm like going, I want my root beer float. So my GPS goes by 35 miles. They didn't tell me that somebody doesn't know how to use a GPS and measure, right? Because it's 37 miles, really. <laughs> so I get to my 37 miles for my, and I'm walking up to get my root beer float. And I'm walking up. Guess who was sitting there already? <laughs> the hippie dude from earlier. He was smoking, wasn't he? Yep, he was sitting there smoking a cig. He had already been there for a couple minutes. He's in there going, putting it down. He didn't have, he had lungs. I'm like, what in the world is going on? And so the other thing in this comparison where sometimes it's humbling. And so sometimes it's not meant to defeat us, but it's to humble us. When we look at other people and we see what they've accomplished, it should be humbling inside. And make it, when I saw this, I'm like, here I am. I was brushing this guy off. I thought this guy, there's no way this guy's going to make it. He beat me. <laughs> I know. Because the other problem with the comparing side is this. Some of us think you're too good for stuff. You've written off people. You've brushed them to the side. And the funny thing is, we're all striving for the same root beer float. We're all striving for the same goals. Their method might be different. They might look different. They might be different. Their way of getting there might be different. You might not like it. But if the goal is to, to do God's great work and to be a follower and believer of Jesus Christ, I don't care what you look like. I don't care if you don't fit the mold. And I can't think that I'm better than you just because I think I got the tight pants like no everybody else does. You know, I have the outfit that matches everyone else. And so God has called some of you. You're, you're the hippie. You've got, you, you've got a new way of looking at things. You've got a different way of looking at things. You've been called to do something that I don't see. Our same goal and objective is the same. And I want to say thank you, God, for creating the hippie. You know, thank you for the, those of you in this room who God has given a passion to that I don't see. I don't have to see it. As long as it's God's passion in your life and you achieve it, that is what's awesome. That's what makes this room necessary that we take all of you weird, intermingled people, you hippies, you weird persimmon people, or whatever, and we put you all in the same room <laughs> But we're all here for the same purpose. That's what makes coming together so awesome. That's what makes being a part of a body of believers so awesome. Amen. Top that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I was just kind of thinking through this last point here, you know, just, just staying focused on who you are in Christ. And, and so the distractions the enemy is throwing at us is it's not just the distraction from a great work that God has called us to do, but it's also the great work that God is doing in us. We're all at different places along the journey. You know, and, and you know, Jesus says stay connected to the vine. You know, John 15. You know, we got to stay connected with him and we got to stay connected with one another and just continue to be who God has called us to be, staying focused. Don't let the enemy throw us off whatever distraction he throws at us. But just stay focused on who he's called us to be and let him continue the work in us. In the midst of our hurts, our, our hang-ups, our habits, whatever, God, he's molding us and turning us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And like Roger said, in the end, we're all going to be sharing a root beer float together in the kingdom. And so we got to stop looking around at, at other things and just stay focused on the prize. As Paul said, he said, look, my, my life was a mess. I, I messed up. I was there killing people. And I've done all these things. I thought I was doing everything right. And I was doing everything wrong. But now I just consider all that rubbish, garbage, waste. And I'm staying focused on one thing, finishing the race that God has set before me for the purpose of Christ. Amen? Amen. You want to pray? Let me do it. You do it. 